Coming up next on This Week in Computer Hardware, that new MacBook Pro screen is gorgeous. And yes, there is a new MacBook Air, finally. Intel says 10 nanometer next year. And look at the stupid amount of money we made this year. And oh, you're going to want this, my digital SSD, all that and more coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. This is Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 490, recorded on November 1st, 2018. iPad Pro, so pretty, so spendy. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by On Deck. Are you a small business owner in need of capital today? Well, On Deck can help. With over $10 billion in loans and an A-plus rating from the Better Business Bureau, On Deck is a lender you can trust. Visit ondeck.com slash twitch to learn more and to receive a free consultation with one of their U.S.-based loan specialists. And by Command Line Heroes, a podcast from Red Hat. Listen to the epic true tales of the developers, programmers, hackers, geeks, and open source rebels revolutionizing the technology landscape. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and visit redhat.com slash heroes today. And by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Introducing Rate Shield Approval. If you're in the market to buy a home, Rate Shield Approval locks up your rate for up to 90 days while you shop. It's a real game changer. Learn more and get started at rocketmortgage.com slash twit. Welcome to Twits This Week in Computer Hardware. Twits Weekly Show that aims to bring you hardware news, reviews, discussion of what's important in hardware, desktops, mobile, laptops, consoles, the Internet of Stuff, and anything else we think actually fits under the hardware banner. I'm Patrick Norton, joined by Alan Malventano of PC Per. Let the games begin. <laughs> I, feel like I, I feel like I need to grab a weapon and run for the forest or something. I don't, I don't know what I have to do here. In a world gone mad. Uh, uh, I digress. Uh, you know, it's a uh, big week this week. Um, mostly, I think, because Apple uh, did their announcement, which I think I, I, I feel, I'm using feeling words here in the group, uh, I feel that the majority of the products we expected to be, um, well, announced weren't. Uh, and mostly this was about the MacBook Air. I think it was probably the most important thing or the thing that will be bought by the most, uh, the largest number of humans who uh, operate with the OS 10 lifestyle. 13-inch um, with Retina display is looking particularly compelling. Uh, $1299, $1399 version. So it's a, you know, your basic 13.3-inch backlit IPS display, 2560 by 1600. Gives you a Retina-ish 227 pixels per inch. That's a fine resolution or, or pixel density for a screen. Um, but given that we're looking at like Pixel 3 phones with something upwards of 500 pixels per inch. Seems a little less dense than it would have not too long ago. By the way, the Pixel 3, uh, by all counts, a fantastic phone. I won't get into that at the moment. Um, I was a little underwhelmed by the MacBook Air's processors. Uh, 1.6 gigahertz dual core Intel Core t uh, i5. Turbo boost up to 3.6 gigahertz. 4 megabytes of L3 cache. They have... Uh, the, the inexpensive version of this comes with a 128 gigabyte PCIe SSD, uh, double that. Uh, and I, I would say for most people, I would try to pony up for the $1,300.99 version. If for no other reason, then you get uh, twice as much storage. Both of them come from the factory with 8 gigabytes of DDR RAM or DDR3. Uh, you can get up to 16 gigabytes in it, which is pretty nice for a sub three pound laptop. They're claiming up to 12 hours of wireless web, i.e. work usage, uh, and up to 13 hours of movie playback uh, if you're doing MPEG-4 iTunes movies. Um, it's an interesting design. People uh, people seem to be really – one, it took forever to kind of do this. Two, um, it's uh, it's kind of a MacBook Pro light it's, in terms of the design aesthetic. Um, it's kind of a MacBook uh, – with a taper, which, which is what I think makes it the air now. Um, USB-C, which is nice. Uh, Touch ID. Um, you know, I could kind of, you know, it, it's funny because I, I feel like on some level an XPS or a Yoga Killer this isn't, given the only processor option on this laptop. I do love that it supports Thunderbolt 3 eGPUs. Uh, those are external GPUs. Um, 
you know, uh, two USB-C ports, which support charging display ports, uh, Thunderbolt up to 40 gigabits per second, uh, and of course, USB-C 3.1 Gen 2, which is up to 10 gigabits per second. And it has a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, which uh, I am down with. Um, this is probably the MacBook, uh, I think it was The Verge or somebody, was basically, this is the MacBook most people should buy. And I can't really argue with that. Um, you know, at the same time, it was really curious to look at the iPad Pro that was announced. Um, and there's a lot of stuff going on with this laptop. Um, you know, first, or laptop, this tablet. Um, you know, Face ID, there's no home button. It's got USB-C, <gasps> which I'm actually totally down with because I am completely in love with USB-C. Um, and uh, really slimmer bezels than we've ever seen. And I appreciate the design aesthetic. I'm really kind of jamming on the lack of a home button. I'm going to say that right now. Um, yeah, it I was really hate the camera. It was, it was taking some room. But right. yeah, it's a. I I I appreciate the lack of a home button. I just want to say that two or three more times. <laughs> <laughs> More than, really more than I expected. Um, they call it the new all-screen design. A magical piece of glass that does everything you need, any way you hold it, in a world gone mad. Um, sort of sounds like, and, sounds like the design requirement for the original iPad, though. Yeah, the gesture controls. One of the things that everybody got hands-on with it at the event, which was in Brooklyn, of all places. Go, Brooklyn. Um that the gestures actually, unlike many of the gestures we've seen in a lot of phones lately, did not suck, which is a big deal as far as I'm concerned. Because so much of what I'm running into, um, it, it's amazing how hard so many Android developers work to develop distinctive gestures uh, or features or services that are mostly a wicked rip and pain in the ass that only cause you to, say, lose a phone connection. Because apparently if you do this three times and then poke your fingers that causes you to disconnect your call. I'm exaggerating and mocking, um, but to actually have people get hands-on with the device and say, hey, you know what? Flicking up to get to the home, that's that's actually kind of nice. Just swipe up to go home. So uh -huh. um, fairly powerful design. Um, you know, the, the A12X Bionic um, has the neural engine uh, that enables advanced machine learning, mostly which I think seems to be, you know, kind of around uh, art and photography at this point. Um, are, are, you know, do you feel any love um, for the for the new iPad Pros? I mean, what's kind of interesting is they seem to be gunning so much for game development on this platform because one of the big focuses there, it's like, the graphics are twice as fast. Look at this NBA game. Um <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's. it seems to me they're just trying to, you know, have a big screen that does all the things. Um, right. I mean, it looks like a great design, you know. I mean, I I picked up the, I think, the original iPad Pro when it came out just because it was, you know, the one I had before that was getting kind of old. But I'm not really a heavy iPad user. Um, right. I don't know if this is still enough to get me to just, like, switch off my laptop to move over to this, but... It looks like it's getting close, um, right? They're they're definitely uh, they're definitely trying to push it uh, as right. far as what the what this particular tech can pull off with iOS. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, it's impressive. Um, the The speaker design seems interesting to me. Like they're supposed to have woofers and tweeters, and actually, if you look, you have to like freeze frame that video and catch just the right part. But there are you can tell the battery is smaller in order to be able to fit the, uh, you know, the the extra size of the of the drivers that are in that. So it it should sound pretty good, um, especially since you have you know, f well, I mean for for what it is, right? Um, <laughs> there, that that I can get down with. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it shouldn't sound you know, as awful as these things often sound. Uh, I'm I am concerned. Right. I feel that the more a company talks about either their partnership with Dolby or the extraordinary speaker designs they put into a device, uh, the more underwhelmed I am when I finally get my ears on it. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's fair. But, so, uh, you know, all, all that said, to be able to, you know, make the thing thinner, lighter, 
you know, bigger screen, smaller bezel, all that. Uh, I think iPad was kind of overdue for that treatment. Right. I mean, they've kind of made they've made little notching in, improvements there, uh, you know, over the years. But this one looks like it's it's you know a decent jump. Um, Part of what's kind of brutal for me is is when you talk about replacing your laptop, the smart keyboard folio for that third generation 12.9 inch iPad Pro is 200 bucks. Um, yeah, which just seems brutal to me. And, and the 11 inch version is $179. That seems like a lot to add on to the price of one of these tablets. Yeah, I don't remember having to spend that nearly that much on the keyboard for my original iPad Pro. I don't think it was that high. Hmm. Apparently this one's super special. <laughs> I'll just uh, take your word for it. Well, it's it's I yeah. I'm 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 looking for some justification for the price on this and uh it's because it connects to the uh, $150 more expensive, uh, you know, iPad. Well, it does provide elegant front and back protection when you're not using it. Yeah, they they mentioned that. I didn't see, like, what protected the back. Because it, it didn't look. Folds over. Uh, I guess it just didn't look like it. It wrapped all the way around, but I guess I, you know, need to rewatch no, it how it does. It. If if you dig into it, you can see where it's got, you know, in. If you if you click on the picture of it in the in the folded the side view of the folded position, you can see uh -huh. how it completely wraps around the back and the front when it's closed. Hmm. So you know, in that sense, you get a keyboard and some protection for your device. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a bigger cover. It's, <laughs> it's just you know, and and presumably it saves you from having to do the things where like on my iPad Pro, I got one of those. Uh, they call it an armor suit skin. It's basically just like a kind of the same thing as a clear bra for a car. Um, right. Except you, you apply it to the back of the iPad just so it doesn't get all kind of banged up and scratched up and whatnot. So, yeah, I mean, if it saves you from doing that, maybe it's worth a little bit more, but it still seems kind of pricey. You want to know it's really pricey. If you dig into the iPad Pro purchasing that $990, $999, the $1,000, 64 gigabyte uh, iPad Pro, has 64 gigabytes of memory. Uh, you can bump up to 256 gigs of storage. I should say storage, not memory, for 11.49. Go ahead and click on silver on the if you're watching the video. There you go. Uh, yeah, 512 yeah. gigabytes for 13.49 and one terabyte for a healthy 1749 dollars. Oof, so, that's painful. Yeah, that's. Uh, that's right, just, pricey. There, but. <laughs> if you if you spec it out all the way, uh, it's like nineteen hundred bucks for a tablet without a keyboard. Well, you know what? Now that keyboard yeah. seems reasonably priced for your, yeah. your two thousand yeah. dollar laptop. Well, but if you add it, dollar, excuse me, your add twenty one hundred dollar tablet with keyboard. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, and you haven't even added the pencil. You know, The Verge had an interesting article. Uh, Talking about uh, the the specs in terms of gaming performance, um, and the name of the article is "The iPad Pro Isn't an Xbox Competitor Even with Console-Like Specs," um, because it seems that Apple's desperate for game developers to develop games for, or at least on, I would say for the iPad Pro. Quote, part of the way that Apple conveys that message is by dunking on consoles like Sony's PlayStation or Microsoft's Xbox by using specific phrases in its presentation as it did yesterday, or by using a specific phrase in its presentation as it did yesterday. Quote, it provides an experience that rivals consoles for the very first time. End quote, and end quote. Um, so, yeah. And they were, hmm. it's funny because they're comparing it to an Xbox One S, which is a $200 like console at this, play, at this point, you right. know, versus now, this $1,000 professional tablet now granted uh this is probably the first ipad that you could legitimately try to use as a as like mm -hmm. a console like because you can hook this up to a television you know it's USB-C. it actually will do display out um i mean heck it'll it'll you can charge your charge your iphone off of the you can use it as a power source like you know juice goes the other way um uh, but yeah, I mean, you could potentially like sit this down next to a television. 
don't know how the game controller thing would work or what the compatibility would be there, but like, you know, there's a few missing links in the chain, but that could legitimately be a thing. I don't know if you're going to spend two grand on a on a tablet just so you can occasionally hook it up to a television and play games on it, or if the games are even going to support that kind of a configuration, but the possibility is there now at least, whereas before it was, you know, it was just the iPad screen is what you were going to have to use. Um. Yeah, I don't know. You never know. Maybe something might come of that particular uh, possibility. I guess. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not feeling a tremendous amount of enthusiasm for you in that statement. Uh, I mean, I just, I just don't have much confidence that it will actually happen. I'm excited for the possibility that it does happen. I just that ha- it has to be like Apple has to do the thing with the thing to to make that you know to make that a reality. There you have yeah. it. Um, I think one of the other things that uh, I don't know if it surprised people, but uh, MacBook Pro, uh, if, if you if you start digging into the press release from yesterday, uh, one of the things you find is that a uh, AMD Vega graphics option is going to be coming to the to the MacBook Pro. Um, Yeah, quote, Apple also today announced new MacBook Pro graphics options that will bring powerful Radeon Pro Vega graphics to MacBook Pro for the first time. These graphics options deliver up to 60% faster graphics performance for the most demanding video editing, 3D design, and rendering workloads. Uh, Just in case you were wondering. Yeah, uh, it's as if they had some extra Vega GPUs lying around. (laughs) <laughs> you know from maybe this maybe this thing where there used to be a lot of demand and now suddenly uh it was as if suddenly the the demand was silenced suddenly uh, the whole yeah yep yeah so uh 15 inch macbook pros are going to get either the radeon pro vega 20 or the radeon pro vega 16 uh, it's going to hit in about two weeks. November 14th is the date that they talk about or talked about in the events or after the events. And we don't know what the cost will be. But looking at the price of storage on the iPad Pro, I'm I'm feeling uh, that it's probably going to be painfully expensive. <laughs> probably. Just saying. Probably. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by On Deck. On Deck is 100% committed to small business owners with fast, easy, tailored financing. Your time is valuable. You want to get funding in as fast as 24 hours with term loans up to $500,000, lines of credit up to $100,000, none of which require business collateral. You should be thinking about On Deck. The application process, it's simple. You can apply online, you can apply by phone, you can get approved in minutes, and it won't impact your personal credit. On Deck delivers some of the best customer service with their U.S.-based loan specialists and has an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, they've led to over, brace for this, people, $10 billion to over 80,000 small business owners. They carry a 9.8 out of 10 rating on Trustpilot. OnDeck is the secure financing service that business owners everywhere can truly rely on. Their simple and secure web platform and mobile app make it easy to access your account anywhere, anytime, if you're a small business owner and you need access to capital, go to ondeck.com slash twitch right now. And as a listener of This Week in Computer Hardware, you'll receive a free consultation with one of their U.S.-based loan specialists. Apply online or by phone and get approved in minutes. Go to ondeck.com slash twitch. That's O-N-D-E-C-K dot com slash T-W-I-C-H for your free consultation now. That's ondeck.com slash twitch. And we want to thank On Deck for their support of this weekend computer hardware. Hmm. Powerful computers. Have you ever wanted a loan to buy a powerful computer, Alan? Uh, have I ever wanted a loan to do so? <laughs> have you contemplated a loan? Have you contemplated uh, buying a big, powerful machine? I've I'm never tried gone, desperately to segue. I've never this. gone. Uh, <laughs> I've never gone so bold. As to require a loan during my PC upgrade. However, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's that's kind of how things are sometimes these days. If you want to go crazy with your core count or or get the newest, shiniest uh, Intel 
products. Usually they have a, at least one consumer CPU that will cost you a grand. <laughs> right. What about the AMD Ryzen Threadripper 2920X and 2970WX that were so just those... recently tested somewhere yeah. in the room you're sitting in? Well, somewhere near the room you're sitting in. <laughs> uh, somewhere near the room I'm sitting, yes. Um, so what they're going for here is some middle ground, right? Uh, they previously had a uh, 32 and a six, or yeah, 16 and 32 core uh, Ryzen Threadrippers. Um, now they've introduced a 12 core and a 24 core. Now I realize all of these are, are are able to do hyper threading, so they're you know they can these parts. The 12 slash 24 is actually 24 slash 48 threads. Uh, if you if you check out that that chart there, and uh, the pricing is sort of in line with what you would expect, roughly proportional to the number of cores that you're getting um, for those parts. So if you you know if you previously uh, didn't want to spend the 1800 bucks on the 32 core part, but you wanted more than 16 cores. Mm -hmm. uh, now there's an option and it's, uh, you know, it's uh, a decent amount cheaper than uh, the, the behemoth 32 slash 32 core slash 64 thread part. Um, you know, kind of gives you a, a, a little bit fewer cores. Uh, there are some catches here though. If you scroll down a little further. Uh, this is a, a service uh, sort of fix uh, in, in an attempt to correct the deficiencies of just the architecture. It's not really a deficiency. It's just that uh, Windows is currently not smart enough to take full advantage of uh, this particular layout of having uh, PCI devices and your memory just connected in, in ways where they might not necessarily be directly connected uh, to a mm -hmm. die. Just it just depends on you know which which configuration you end up with. Um, so in other words, you might have to make some extra hops over that infinity fabric depending on which core uh, the thread is sitting on at that moment. Um, so what dynamic local mode does? It is a service, uh, basically just a piece of software that's uh, developed by AMD, and it it kind of keeps an eye on what threads are running and where they're running, and it tries to just uh, sneak in there and kind of nudge the CPU, if you will, be like, hey, uh, this thing will run quicker if you run it on on this other core over here. You know, it kind of like sets the affinity in the background of some of the some of the processes running on your system, and the end goal is supposed to be, uh, you know, keeping the latencies down and keeping uh, applications from having to access memory that's on, you know, connected to the wrong. Uh, die right and, and make that extra hop across the fabric to get you know to get to where it's where it's trying to go um now ken did a bunch of testing um uh the 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 story is very much the same as it was for the previous two threadripper parts the you know the 16 and 32 core which we've, we've reviewed in the past and the story then and also now is basically single threaded performance intel still, still reigns supreme uh, you know, for any given single-threaded workload, generally speaking, Intel will usually have an advantage over AMD. Uh, however, when you start talking about the multiple core workloads, where you know, I mean, these are you can get these parts in more cores than you can get, you know, more cores and more cheaply than you can get the equivalent Intel parts. Um, mm -hmm. right. So you only get a 18-core uh, Skylake X <laughs> for two grand. Whereas you can get a 32 core, uh, you know, behemoth of a Threadripper for a couple hundred bucks cheaper, right? So you're getting more cores, lower price. Um, that that single thread speed might not be as good, but hey, you got a lot more cores. So if you're doing workloads that are more parallel in nature and can be spread out and take advantage of those additional cores and threads that you have available, then you know you're going to get more bang for your buck um, in, in in that respect. Um, the uh, now, of course, since it is a kind of a desktop granted workstation, but still, people might want a game on this thing. So we ran, you know, Ken did at least one page worth of some benchmarks, um, and he noticed that dynamic local mode, which is supposed to help you keep the performance of basically anything higher, you know, by informing mm -hmm. Windows of of where you know put these things over here and they'll run faster. Uh, if you scroll down to that second chart there, uh, Shadow and the Tomb Raider. Dynamic local mode enabled actually saw a decrease in the frame rate. 
Uh, so it took a little bit of a performance hit. Now, granted, this could probably be tuned, and it's probably something that's just, you know, uh, AMD could fix in software and just come out with an updated version of that that service. Um, but the story here is basically, don't expect it to just be a, a you know, a fix-everything solution that just makes everything all better. You might still have to, you know, if, you, if you're very critical of what the performance is of a particular thing, you might have to do a little bit of experimenting and just see if the service helps you or not. Right. And if it if it actually, you know, uh, is things are going the wrong way, uh, then you can just, you know, either uninstall the software or you can actually Ken was saying uh, you can just kill the service, um, you know, and, and things will go back to normal because it's not trying to redirect which thread is where uh, and, and whatnot. But, you know, just basically it's, it's more options available for different numbers of cores on the AMD side and uh, leaves Intel to still have to try to fill all of those voids now, right? They're going to have to scramble a little bit and try to, you know, AMD just introduced two more price points for something that still looks like a budget, uh, granted, workstation and still expensive, but <laughs> lower, you know, lower cost solution, more bang for the buck solution. Um, so now, now Intel's probably going to have to try to figure out what they're going to do to try to counter that. Um, so interested to, to see how that pans out, uh, potentially some lower cost workstation style parts coming from Intel to counter that. I mean, we don't know, but you would figure they would have to try to do some sort of a response. Um, as a consumer, I'm okay with that kind of fight. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, you know, let them, let them race to the bottom on, on price for, for right. cores. Um, we were kind of reminiscing a little bit on the podcast last night and like is it, you know it wasn't that long ago where uh you know quad core was like a, a big deal and it was like that was just kind of it right you didn't and now all of a sudden we have 32 cores in a in a workstation slash desktop part well you you can That's you can <laughs> build a 32 core system for less than the price of a mediocre used car um <laughs> sure sure you know uh, it wasn't so but still the, it, it's it's new and exciting, but part a big part of it being new and exciting is that you can you know you can do it without having to mortgage your house or sell your house to buy it. I think is a big part of that. Yeah, or, uh, you know, and and hopefully it it drives things a little bit more. Now, granted, on the on the desktop side, it's it's <laughs> been yes, there has been multiple core systems for a while now. Chances are, any given piece of software is not going to be single threaded, but there's still a lot of that. Um, <laughs> Still, plenty of things that are that are single threaded that should be multi threaded, and uh, hopefully this sort of a swing even further into the uh, you know higher core counts and in, in, in uh, even the lower end desktop parts um, should should try to make the software push a little bit forward a little bit further forward to take more advantage of that and hopefully speed them some things up you know that that have just kind of been stuck with the single threaded. Uh, performance for years, right? Um, so let's just hope that that's another little bonus that we get out of this. Uh, that would be nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not holding my breath, but it would be nice. It would be nice. You know, it takes uh, developers and in, in all over the place not coming together, but just sort of <laughs> changing their code individually. And, you know, it takes a while for that kind of thing to happen. Hence my not holding my breath. Yeah, yeah, I am, however, willing to hold my breath. Uh, I, I, I'm every time we turn around, uh, we we haven't hit uh, the, uh, the 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 hoped for and desired ten cents a gigabyte. Uh, although we are alarmingly close, I think you did a, a look at my digital SSD. We've talked about this brand. You've talked about this brand before on uh, yep this week computer hardware. Most people have not heard of this company. You you. Or are we going to be more excited about my digital SSD or less after you took a look at the the, the BPX Pro M.2 NVMe SSDs? Yeah, I'm I'm more excited for them. Uh, it's a solid product. Um, so what we're looking at here is so a little bit of backstory. My digital SSD slash my digital discount is a company that they try to just put out a no frills product. Hey, can we can we get this SSD together and just kind of get it out the door and you know, good enough for government work sort of thing, right? It, they might not be the best performance, but they're definitely going for the budget uh, proposition right. here. They're trying to get low-cost SSDs out there, decent performance, you know, j just just get the thing out the door so people can buy it, 
right? Uh, you know, if people, if they're going to hit 10 cents a gig, like it's probably going to be a company like this is one of the first ones to, to get there in the future, right? So what you're looking right. at is the uh, the relatively new Fizon E12 controller. Uh, it's coupled with uh, Toshiba Bix 3. That's TLC NAND. It's uh, it's uh, just 3D NAND from Toshiba. Um, it is not DRAM-less. It's, uh, they, they had to pay for DRAM to add mm -hmm. it to this product. To, that helps keep performance up. Absolutely uh, shown by this chart right here where the... 960 gig BPX Pro in random performance uh, is actually beating a one terabyte 970 Evo on both reads and writes. Whoa. Uh, yes, which is very impressive. Uh, it's not beating it by much, but it is ahead of Samsung. And the the reason I always put a Samsung, uh, you know, to, uh, one or two Samsung products at the bottom of pretty much any SSD review uh, as far as like where they where they sit on the charts is those are like the benchmark comparison points, right? Those are right. where how does everything else stack up against this 970 Evo if they're if they're like TLC SSDs? And I put it in there and and the BPX Pro beat it. Uh, so good on them, right? Um, right. Perfor performance uh, a, a good amount ahead of the prior generation, which was just a BPX. Um, which is I, w I will say it's probably good that my digital SSD is beating. Uh, in performance because when you start digging around amazon so that that one terabyte or 960 gigabytes uh my digital ssd that's selling for 260 dollars and that's right in line with the samsung 970 evo series that's selling for 278 dollars for a one terabyte drive so yeah i mean that's yeah. that's impressive and if you're looking for an inexpensive NVMe drive, well, you're not going to get one out of the 960 Evo series because they're sort of end of life far enough that they're actually selling for more than the 970 or some of the other competitors out there in that one terabyte right. capacity. Um, right. Um, so uh, sequential access, I mean, pretty good. What you know, mm -hmm. uh, reads weren't as fast as a 970 Evo. Um, and when we started to load down the SSD a little bit more with our mixed test, um, the read speed that we were measuring was maybe 15, 10, 15% slower than Samsung. And in this particular test, the read speed is critical because that's the kind of thing where you're actually waiting for the system to do something. Um, mm -hmm. And so the next chart down just shows like how long would you have waited to load a total of four gigabytes worth of information as you had background things going on? And uh, Samsung came in a little bit less than five seconds. BPX Pro 960 gig came in a little bit over six seconds. So, but if you look at the trend there, uh, you right. know the prior gener prior generation was taking more than twice as long as Samsung in this same mm -hmm. test. Uh, however, now they're kind of closing that gap considerably. Uh, you know, almost catching up with Samsung there. Um, the only uh, the only negative to speak of I came across was in our caching test. Um, and the caching performance was a bit inconsistent, or at least a, you know more inconsistent than I would hope for uh, from these drives. I think it just comes down to uh, you know the the guys that they pro they probably took the base Fizon firmware, just what came with that controller, and did what they needed to to make it work with that flash, and didn't necessarily do a lot of like performance tuning. Uh, they did manage to get some really good random performance and and sequential, but the uh, you know if, if you're going to get this, don't get it with the thought of you absolutely positively need the SLC speed like all the time uh, because you might not get it if you're if you're uh, loading it down with some you know large files. And this test is kind of arduous for an SSD to perform. However, other SSDs we've we've tested on this very same sort of a test, they're usually more consistent on giving you X amount of cache, like cache speed, and then after so many seconds worth of it or so many gigabytes worth of writes at that speed, then suddenly things slow down to the slower speed. And that's what you would expect for just a caching SSD, but uh, the way this test is supposed to work is there's supposed to be longer, faster regions on the left and right outer edges of of these charts, and in reality, it was kind of kind of like hit or miss. Like you might get a few gigabytes worth of caching on this particular right, but then maybe the next one you might get twenty or thirty or maybe even sixty gigabytes worth of caching. But it wasn't consistent. 
Um, and what I look for in this test is every time you give the SSD some idle time, it should do everything it can to clear that cache so that you have as, as much of that available so that the next write you do can has a better chance of staying at that higher speed for as long as possible. Um, and it was a bit kind of like hit or miss um, on these. Now, granted, if you buy the one terabyte model, uh, even if you catch it not going the cached speed, you still, you're still going a gigabyte per second, even at the slow speed. Uh, so I'm okay with if, that. If, yeah. So if you're, if you're source Somehow of information, I'll manage. <laughs> right. So, so if you don't, if you don't have anything else in your system, that's ever going to produce data at more than a gigabyte per second, like you don't have another source that's that fast, uh, mm -hmm. don't worry about it. Right. It, Cause you're, you're never going to see that slower speed anyway. You're never going to notice it because you just won't have a source that can fill it that fast, uh, at that rate. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a very low cost, uh, part. Most of them are running 27 cents a gig. Um, if, if you want a price like that, uh, you know, there, there's, there's bound to be some little trick there, some little thing you just need to be aware of. Uh, but for the vast majority of people that are going to be using this particular kind of an SSD and they're just looking for a, you know, budget part, they can throw it in something, uh, get a good experience. This is, uh, this would be fine for them. I'm excited. Yeah. I just want to say that. I'm cheaper I'm, SSDs, man. I'm I'm so down with cheaper SSDs. This yep. is a good thing. Uh you guys actually uh Sebastian did a nice write up on uh, Corsair. Kind of out of the blue, like six AM this morning, uh Corsair <laughs> announced their RGB platinum two hundred and eighty millimeter liquid CPU cooler. Um, which is essentially uh, unicorn vomit. Um, lots and lots of <laughs> RGB uh, applied to their Hydro Series lineup. Um, so this is uh, with the massive 280 millimeter uh, fans, um, which I guess is two 140 millimeter fans. But um, you know, they basically got it in. Uh, Sebastian got it in time to do some launch day benchmarking. What's uh, I? You know, how good is it? Was it awesome? I mean, you, you can't I mean, really compare it to the to the smaller version because I don't think you have the time to, to benchmark that. But it it's looking. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're, you're gonna. You're, it, I I think for most of these, it's just the incremental upgrade with uh, right. the added RGB, all the things thrown in, right? Um, you know, there's been there's been demand for this. There's been people that have been buying the non RGB versions of this core and then buying RGB fans and trying to get the controller and do all these other things to make it work, and Instead, Corsair is just like, here you go. Here's just a, a solution that has all that, if, if that's what you're looking for. If not, I mean, we make these other ones that don't have R, you know, RGB LEDs on them. Um, Part of what was interesting about this for me is, is the thermals didn't look particularly impressive compared to some of the, the other uh, Corsair, the H115i, the H100 Pro, uh, H100i Pro, which were like, you know, nine eight nine degrees cooler um but one of the things that sebastian noticed was that they seem to have tuned this um for minimizing the actual noise and this is pretty impressive one uh that he actually has a, a db meter that can measure as, as low as uh 30 db um but two when you're looking at the h115i um in quiet mode it's down around like 31.6 db 31.8 right. db Full load. That's pretty impressive. And even in extreme mode, you're still looking at a max of like 39.4 dB. That's that's pretty good. Right. So the thing to consider there is that while the temperatures were running, you know, temperatures were running slightly higher, in all likelihood, it was probably because the those default or whatever that particular setting was equivalent from, you know, from or that particular setting on this particular product might not have been an equivalent fan speed compared right. to, you know, the other products that might have been a little noisier at that same setting um, and therefore getting you some lower temperatures. So if you're worried about that, basically just run it one notch higher than you would have the other product. Uh, and you should be fine probably at an equivalent uh, equivalent amount of sound, um, you know, coming from there. They're probably just, my gut feel is they're probably just slightly slower RPM fans, just the RGB variant of them. Maybe they just spin a little bit slower for a given input voltage. Uh, so, you know, just slightly lesser cooling, slightly warmer temperatures, but you can always compensate by just cranking up the, cranking up the speed a bit. 
Just turn it up, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, one of the things uh, Sebastian also points out is is the trade off for all of this glorious RGB joy and these massive fans and radiator. Um, and I got to say that the radiator design looks really, really clean. Um, so you've got RGB on the pump slash cooler that mounts on your CPU. You've got RGB on the fans, and you've got a uh, healthy price tag of about $170. I think that was one of the reasons this only received a silver reward. But if you're looking for a highly colorful and quiet cooler, this should probably be on your short list. Just want to say that. And uh, I can think of someone who would love a fully unicorn vomit enabled liquid cooler, but we'll talk about that on another day. <laughs> This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware brought to you by Command Line Heroes. That's an original podcast for geeks by geeks from Red Hat. Command Line Heroes dedicated to telling the epic true tales of the developers, programmers, hackers, geeks, and open source rebels who are revolutionizing the technology landscape. If you think Command Line Hero, wasn't that a Brian Adams song? No. No, you, you might be one if you've ever taken something apart to see how it works, or if you'd rather make your own. Command Line Heroes, the makers, the builders, the dreamers, the doers who are transforming tech and shaping our tomorrows. Season 2 of Command Line Heroes, all about living on the command line and tracking the changes that shape the world of open source development. They're discovering the origins of programming languages, mastering the art of making a pull request, learning about supercomputers, hybrid clouds, and so much more. Command Line Heroes is produced by Red Hat, an open source company that started in an apartment 25 years ago and knows a thing or two about where tech came from and where it's going. Season 2 is also hosted by Saran Yabarak, a developer who founded Code Newbie, hosts two other tech podcasts, and lives and breathes open source software. We're taking Season 2 to great heights and beyond. Episode 1 launched on September 11th, so visit redhat.com slash heroes to check it out today. Subscribe to Command Line Heroes wherever you get your podcasts and visit redhat.com slash heroes for extras. And to learn more, that's redhat.com slash heroes. We want to thank Red Hat for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. <laughs> Jeremy occasionally comes up with slightly naughty decks uh, or titles. He does. You will. Yeah, yeah. Is Intel thinking of hooking up with TSMC again? You know how it turned out the last time. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to stop with the lewdness right there. Um, mm -hmm. So TSMC, uh, uh, you know, it's been a while, right? TSMC had done some fabrication work for Intel. Um, but Digitimes, and Digitimes loves their rumors. Uh, they seem to be having the feels, the suspicions. The rumor mongering has started that uh, that Intel uh, may be outsourcing some of their low-end processors and chipsets. Um, and uh, the idea is that they're going to keep Xeon and core CPU production in-house. Uh, uh, Joseph Tsai wrote this up at digitizes.com. And, uh, you know, while putting stuff like the Atom processors, which, you know, offer a little less of the profit margin that they like, uh, or a smaller amount of the profit margin they like. Um, and that Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company can actually turn around rush orders. Um, Intel declined to comment on, quote, market rumors. And uh, sources stated, quote, Intel CPU shortages grew worse in the second half of 2018, and the problem has greatly expanded from traditional TC market to the industrial PC sector with Intel's high-end server CPUs also reportedly experiencing tight supply and, uh, you know, first of all, it looks like Intel's going to drop another billion, uh, you know, across this year, you know, by the end of this year uh, to expand its 14 nanometer manufacturing sites uh, to keep the Xeon and core processors functioning. And then at the low end, the IoT stuff, the entry level PCs, the appliance type stuff, they're going to put the Atom processors uh, somewhere else. And TSMC looks to be, uh, looks to be the direction that's going to go in. And uh, that, of course, uh, you know, there's a, a nice register article that came out this week. Or, a, you know, a register article. I don't know if nice is the right word for it. A thoughtful and well-informed article posted up at the register.co.uk. Uh, Intel, quote, you'll get 10 nanometer next year. Now witness the firepower of this fully armed cash machine. 
<laughs> as uh, as 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 Jeremy summed up, ten nanometers great. <laughs> so it's nineteen point two billion dollars. Um, you know, so they don't have ten nanometer, and they don't have Brian Krasanich anymore. But revenues up nineteen percent over last year. Uh, it's the best quarter Intel's ever had. $19.2 billion, net income $6.4 billion. And then Jeremy, being Jeremy, pointed out, no wonder they could afford to take Riot away from PC Per. Um, this oh, is the, yeah. uh, and this was mostly uh, the, the, the two biggest standouts, uh, Jeremy notes, the Intel Data Center Group and the IoT division. Um, so they seem to be able to make the monies, uh, and this this they they make it really clear. Um, this was the this quarter was the best in our 50 year history. We expect 2018 to be the best year ever in our third record year in a row. And remember, kids, that's without having, uh, you know, it, it just without moving to the process technology and the processors we kind of expect from them. So. Again, I've said it before, I'll say it again, uh, I may be irritated by what Intel does with enthusiast processors and the pricing, but they know a lot more about making a lot of money than I probably ever will. So, that's a lot of money. <laughs> yes, it is. You know. And it's also interesting, I wonder also how much of that is pent up demand from people building, uh, enthusiasts building PCs or people just buying PCs. Now the GPU prices are back down because one of the things uh, they attribute that they talk about in the Register article um, is, is you know, stronger than expected customer demand, um, both in the PC businesses and in the data businesses. So it's pretty interesting. 22% um, on the data stuff year over year. And, uh, you know the, the the PC group, what they call the client computing group. Um, that was ten point two billion dollars of that sales. And that was up sixteen percent year over year. So I kind of feel that the whole GPUs are completely out of control thing whacked Intel uh, a lot harder than I expected. That's conjecture on my part. Uh, do with it what you will. But man, ten billion dollars in 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 the client group. It's a lot of money. Kevin makes it, I guess, rain, we'll call that. Right on cue. <laughs> right on cue. Just like we thought it was going to happen that way. It's exciting. You know what else is exciting? Not suffering when you get a mortgage. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. We talked about it. You're buying a home, right? Especially now. Um, you know, people are still hurting. The, the, the financial crisis is past, but it's still intense. Buying a mortgage is intense. It's scary. Um, applying for a mortgage uh, you know, is a lot like waking up and just hitting yourself in the face with something hard, just so the rest of the day feels better. Um, it's, you know, people get anxious. Is the interest rate going to go up? What if it goes down? What if I commit to this mortgage and the interest rate goes down? It, we can't help you after you've signed for the mortgage, but our friends at Quicken Loans, they're, they're trying to make this whole process less painful. They call it the power buying process. It's really simple. You answer a few questions. They check your credit for, for pre-qualified approval. Second step, Quicken Loans, they verify your income, your assets, your credit. They're going to take less than 24 hours to give you a verified approval. And their goal, they want to give you the strength of a cash buyer. Once you're verified, the final step, you qualify for their all-new exclusive rate shield approval. They lock up your rate for up to 90 days while you shop. They give you three months or, you know, 90 days, whichever that is. And it, it's great. If, you, if, if rates go up, they leave your rate alone. Your rate stays the same. But if rates go down, they'll drop your rate too. Either way, you win. You don't pay more. And if you can pay less, they make it so you can pay less on the interest on your mortgage. It's the kind of thinking you'd expect from America's largest mortgage lender. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash twit. Rate shield approval is only valid on certain 30-year purchase transactions. Additional conditions or exclusions may apply based on Quicken Loans data in comparison to public data records. Equal housing lender license in all 50 states. NMLSconsumeraccess.org number 3030. That's rocketmortgage.com slash twit. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. All right, another news. Uh, hard OCP. 
Let's take a look at the uh, ROG Strix B360i Gaming. Uh, this is actually the same... I believe this is the same motherboard that Ken and I did a rather poor job of... Uh, <laughs> or excruciatingly long job of doing a build uh, a week back in a mini ITX uh, system. Uh, it would have booted up immediately. Uh, however, we were fooled by a power connector on the inside. And, you know, of course there was a loose connector since we decided to just assemble the entire thing and button it all up, every single screw, before turning it on. Uh, sure enough, wouldn't turn on. Anyway, uh, this particular one <laughs> turned on just fine. <laughs> I love that. Um, I, I mean, it's an impressive little motherboard. Uh, one thing I noted when we were doing our build was that... Uh, it has an M.2 slot heatsink built in. And usually I have a beef with these because they put a thermal pad that covers everything. And I'm like, no, you don't need to cool the flash. Just cool the controller. Flash likes to run warm. And sure enough, the pad on this one was only long enough and in the correct position to only contact the, uh, the memory and the controller on the SSD. Mm. So uh, good on it for that. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's... Uh, you can get a lot of a surprisingly good amount of performance out of something small like this these days, right? Um, mm -hmm. So, so yeah. I mean, I need to go through and find what what was the what was the price of this guy? Where does he have it? Board currently selling for one hundred and twenty eight bucks. I mean, you know, it's not bad. Not bad for what it is at all. Um, yeah, and you'd be surprised, you know, how much you can actually, how much performance you can actually get out of this. I don't know if Ken has written it up yet uh, as far as the build. I know he was doing some tests on our setup, but those tests were more meant for testing uh, uh, like an acrylic version of a, I forget what the name of the original case that it's sort of modeled after, but basically there was a mini ITX uh, system that was super tiny, like, I mean, smaller than toaster, tiny. Um, full size GPU in there, everything. Somehow he managed to shoehorn it all into this uh, form factor. And another company made a similar version, but out of all acrylic parts. Um, you know, still works. Nice. Every, everything still works the same way. Uh, still generally fits in the same way. But yeah, in a very, very small form factor, we had a, a pretty good performing system built. The only possible issue was that uh, we might have needed to mod something to get a little bit more air in because if you tried to run the CPU and the GPU full tilt things got a little toasty in there but uh, that's that's sort of to be sort of to be expected but yeah it's a testament to you know you could basically have a full full power desktop system powered by this very small motherboard um, I'm down. might not as get him you know, you might not have as many PCI slots as you as you needed, uh, but as long as you're just, a, <laughs> you know, if you're just a one GPU system and uh, M.2 SSD is good for you, and you don't, you know, uh, you can connect uh, serial ATA devices to it. Uh, it has the ports if you have room in, in the box you're trying to squeeze it into. But I would recommend M.2 if you're trying to be a uh, really small form factor build, uh, just because it's you know less wires, less cables. I'm not trying to fit a two and a half inch SSD somewhere where. Uh, very tiny M.2 SSD, you know, like that BPX Pro we were talking about. Um, you could just go into and set it and forget it. Just consider it as <laughs> Some consider it as setting it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it's 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 if it's uh, for most people, I would imagine the SSD now once they get M.2, it's just part of the motherboard, right? It's just it's part of their build. It's just there you go, part of the system. Not worried about, you know, maybe if you wanted to upgrade capacity later, you might swap it out or something. But most people are probably just going to treat that as part of the part of that board once they've installed it and I would imagine not really a need to mess with it from that point forward it's just that's your storage now it's just part of the motherboard just deal with it people <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh my goodness Amazon Fire TV Stick 4K Robert Heron and I were talking about this on uh, AVXL earlier today if you can deal with all the Amazon cruft the the clutter the promotion the the Amazon 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 which is kind of the heart of a Fire TV experience as far as I'm concerned. Um, this is a pretty crazy machine. They're talking about Dolby Vision, Atmos, HDR10+, and HDR10 for 50 bucks. Um, 
That might be the remote. cheapest. That might be the lowest cost thing that can drive HDR10 that I've heard of. Yeah, well, it's uh, it, it's I I would have to sit down and I would have to sit down and price out um, some of the odder things out there and and take a look at the the, the new Chromecast. But um, in terms of something that can actually run apps and play things, I, I think this is about as cheap as things are going to get. But part of the reason it's so cheap is because you're dealing with this sort of Amazon centric attitude. Um, but, yeah, they're uh, subsidizing the hardware a bit, probably, and in, in the yeah in the uh, you know on the assumption that you're probably going to order some more Amazon stuff if you have uh, access to our ecosystem so easily just yeah. through this thing. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. It's not uh, it's it's crazy how cheap it is. And one of the big deals that's going on there that they uh, one of the big deals that's going on with it is is uh, they also dumped a bunch. They put IR in the controller, so it will. Uh, uh, with the electric voice remote, so it can actually control your television properly and probably your cable TV box, um, which yeah. I think is kind of a big deal for them, and and I think a nice addition for the price. The uh, uh, you know the, you still can't play YouTube on it, which is part of the ongoing peeing contest between YouTube and excuse me between Google and Amazon, which I find really frustrating. Um, and of course, uh, you know, I just I. It's nothing Robert and I were talking about this morning is just how frustrating these sort of high level battles are between uh, uh, the, the ones that obviously that kind of stand out for us at the moment are between Amazon and Google. I don't think it's good for consumers. I think it's irritating. I think it's frustrating. I think it's pointless. Um, but, uh, you know, there's also no uh, native app kind of, you know, that supports Amazon video on a Chromecast. So you could argue uh, they're kind of going back and forth there. But, um, you know, the other thing is there's no Roku that does Dolby Vision, so uh, there's not a huge amount of Dolby Vision content out there, uh, unless you're, uh, in terms of movies, right? Um, Walmart owns Vudu. Vudu has most of the kind of Dolby Vision streaming movies out there. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, Netflix and Amazon do a bunch of Dolby Vision stuff, but it's mostly their in-house programming. Uh, that includes Dolby Vision HDR. So, you know, it, it's got everything you might want, uh, but YouTube. And I, I like watching YouTube on the big screen. So that that would put it in the no column for me. But it's a great price. And if you're kind of deep within the Amazon ecosystem and as an Amazon Prime uh, member, it's it's certainly tempting. It's kind of funny. They're they have a they have a YouTube icon on the Fire TV stick. I just noticed that in the ad for that. So maybe, maybe they're doing something we haven't seen yet. And then we have to yeah. order one just to find out. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I don't even know yep, where yep. to go with that. Uh, we may be re-recording the podcast with Robert, but that's a conversation for another day. <laughs> um <laughs> If you're, if you're curious about the Pixel Three, uh, uh, Shannon did a full review of that on uh, on Tech Thing. Uh, mostly, she realized how much she didn't like her Pixel Two. Uh, mostly because uh, after comparing it to another Pixel, she realized that the boy, there's a lot of blue on that Pixel Two screen. <laughs> Yeah, you know, which is something I was annoyed by every time I looked at it. But I think you kind of tuned out the sort of bluish look to that. We also had uh, Gordon Whitson came on. You, you might know from Lifehacker and How to Geek. He recently did a nice write up for PC Mag on overclocking your CPU. He's now running an Intel, uh, what was it, eighty six seventy K at five gigahertz, um, and uh, that's an interesting conversation because. We talked about the cooling, uh, you know, a new tool he uses to do monitoring and stress testing, OCCT, um, and, uh, you know, just why he is tempted to delid, although he hasn't delidded his system yet, but he was comfortably getting his system up to uh, to 5K, uh, 5,000 hertz, um, without delidding. He did use liquid cooling and, and fairly powerful liquid cooling. But if you're looking for a reason to buy that RGB cooler from Corsair, Overclocking is a good justification. So, anything you can tease that's going on at PC Per? I'm um, just, uh, you know, working on some more storage reviews. Ken's, uh, I think, 
Ken's kind of idling a little bit because, I mean, he just went through this AMD plus Intel plus NVIDIA release all within the same A couple same weeks month. of living in the, uh, living uh, in the he PC basically, Yeah, he's basically just been living in the office. Uh, and, you know, it's, a, it's sort of a thing where you get in a particular zone on how you're, you know, orchestrating your particular testing and whatnot. So it's like not even really like I could help him do it necessarily <laughs> it'd be the same as him trying to help me do storage testing right it's like you know i just i got my mojo here just to let me nose to the grindstone what i'm doing you know and i don't want you to distract my rhythm or whatever yeah. uh same thing Back with off, him man, so i got was, this yeah basically so <laughs> he was he was totally in the zone there for like two or three weeks solid but now i think he he, he needs to like you know catch his breath a little bit so i don't Have think some he's human a, relationships eat some food that won't fit under a door uh, yeah, yeah. I think I think he's doing some of that. Door. Yeah, he's just catching up. You know, catching up on emails and trying to figure out how to you know help help run the site and things. Now that uh, now lot. that we're word, yeah, now that we're Ryanless and we're doing things a little differently. So, you know, but everything seems to be going smoothly so far. Uh, we'll just keep putting <laughs> stuff out. You shouldn't sigh as you're you saying know. things like that. I assume it's, it's just you know it's it's, it's kind of it's just daunting, right? It's just daunting task yeah. kind of things. Um, I'm working on uh, right now. Well, it's already launched, so I can talk about it at Micron P1. Uh, it's basically mm -hmm. the Micron slash crucial version uh, of the Intel 660P, which is their QLC SSD. Right. Uh, also, very good prices on the 660p. Problem was, uh, for the longest time, I think now they're starting to show up in stock in more places. But for the longest time, it was very limited supply, and like you could get them, but only in this one capacity or, or whatnot. <laughs> um, so that's sort of uh, it's kind of sorting itself out over time. But it's good to see uh, the Micron slash Crucial equivalent of that part. Um, and it looks like hardware looks identical. Uh, I think it's just down to firmware tweaks and performance tweaks that either company has made, uh, right. you know, to their respective product products. So, you know, remember that caching thing I was talking about? Like, we'll, we'll expect that to be a potential difference between both companies because they probably tuned how they d do their caching differently, and uh, you know how much how much writing you could do in a row before you deplete the cache. And uh, in the case of uh, quad level cell QLC. Uh, flash memory, it kind of gets a little bit painful when you run out of that cache. It's much more crucial uh, uh, w when that happens. Your, your, your speeds drop to, you know, on the order of less than 100 megabyte meg, or meg per second uh, when that happens. So understandably, uh, they do everything they can to make sure that you have as much cache as you can as, as often as you can. So you, you never see that. Um, and uh, that nice. I actually had... Yeah, I've actually had a QLC SSD in uh, one of my main systems I've been using for a while, and like it's just, you know, I've never run into it, uh, you know, in, a, in that situation where you you just run out. Um, right. You have to you have to pretty much be doing something synthetically, uh, just artificially loading it down for extended periods of time to to hit that. So, but yeah, that's coming. Um, you know. Just, few other random things coming uh it might be a direct attached storage thing launching from one of the larger companies soon here um yeah stuff like that Ooh. there you have it ladies and gentlemen if this is your first episode of twitch this week in computer hardware do yourself a favor Get signed up. Get to your RSS feed over at twit.tv slash twitch so you can download all of our episodes fresh, hot, and steaming off the internet as soon as they are posted. That's twit.tv slash twitch. In case you didn't pick up on it, that's Alan Malventano from pcper.com. I'm Patrick Norton. I work over at techthing.com, T-E-K-T-H-I-N-G.com, and avxcel.com. We talk a lot about uh, screens and speakers and headphones on AVXL because we're AV geeks, I guess. And we want to thank each and every one of you for listening to the podcast or watching it. However you enjoy it, we appreciate you being here, and we'll keep making it for you. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Alan Malentano. Catch you next week on Twitch. Twitch.